All right. Hello, everyone. Coming to you. Hello. Live, well, no tape from Brooklyn. Myself and Elia Lore. All right. Um, so we have. You have a lot of interesting art in the background. Yes. Um, yeah. No, because uh, I'm I an artist of many facets. Um, I'm a uh, visual artist and actor, and also I produce, music, DJ, and sing. Mm -hmm. so, always doing something. Anyway, back to the awesome, uh, back to the intro. So we are gathered here today for a discussion of the Cosmic Discord Tech of Renee, a celebration of the movie getting 200,000 plus views. Woo! Yes. <laughs> it's like, it's like 250,000 by now, isn't it? I think it's close to, to uh, last I checked, it was 276. Wow. Okay. We're going a little bit viral. That's right. That's it's uh, amazing. Hey, I know. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, Go ahead. eventually it, it all pays off. Just, uh, the, the so. constant promotion and the pushing of, uh, yeah, because you're very, um, you're always, always promoting whatever project you're working on and whatever you have in mind for the next project. And it's, you know, eventually the right people see it. It's mm -hmm. working. <laughs> so there's other people in the world besides me and they have, some of them have <laughs> discovered my movie. <laughs> yes. That's uh, it, it's, it's good to find uh, people who appreciate what you've been doing for a long time now. That's right. You know, uh, um, aside from the neighborhood that you, that each individual lives in and travels in or wherever they travel, we don't really <laughs> know if the rest of the world actually exists, right? Well, that's, I mean, that's a reality uh, question, which I, I mean, how, how do you answer questions about the reality that we're in, we're all perceiving through our own little window of existence. And I can't even necessarily prove that the way I experience the color blue is the same way that you do. Mm -hmm. um, we're all just these little creatures speaking from our, our small bubbles mm -hmm. and to a different creature um, like the aliens that, that we'll be discussing a lot of in the next Any movie. Aliens? Yes, uh, we've already started discussing the aliens. Mm -hmm. um, they may have senses that we can't even imagine and are experiencing the universe in, other, in another way. So who knows? Mm -hmm. Who it knows where well. we are and if the world there's a world outside our own minds? Right, because uh, <laughs> you always hear from like YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, we have 500 million users, a billion users, right? But you know, <laughs> no one, no one really knows because no one, no one can really t attract. It's just statement, statements from the company. But what I've learned through the YouTube success of the movie is, <laughs> yeah, apparently there's people all over the world who check out YouTube. And I've been getting yep. actual direct contact emails. Nice. You know, some feedback on uh, YouTube in the form of uh, likes and uh, comments. Uh, yeah. Subscribers. And also on my other channels, people who have seen the movie on YouTube have reached out. So nice. you know, maybe I've talked to around 100 people out of the <laughs> 270,000 mm -hmm. who've seen the movie. And that's like normal. I've looked at movies that have, or shows that have uh, like a billion views and there's like mm -hmm. 5,000 comments, you know, that's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. No, no, that's, that's amazing. I mean, just it, congratulations on, on people finally starting to catch on. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's what it's about. That's I think, how I think it's all about Aaliyah. People discover. Yeah, I think that it's all about Aaliyah. People see the Aaliyah image, they're like, oh, let's see what that's about. I mean, it's a good, it, I, I confess when I saw the image that was being promoted, I was like, 
yeah, yeah, my, my, my butt looks good there. I, I get it. <laughs> well, uh, so it's funny, but there you go. Yeah, People whatever will... works. I mean, uh, sexuality mm -hmm. is so old mm -hmm. and hardwired into people's brains yeah. that when we see mm -hmm. an attractive woman, we notice, most people notice, right? Yeah. Or into that. So, but I the, do. <laughs> yeah, but, the, but the mixture, I mean, I get, you know, internal data. And it's like, um, you know, it's like 60, 70% men versus <laughs> 30, 40% women who check it out. So it's, yeah. not, it's not all men who are just clicking on that image. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, uh, well, it's, it, it has, it has to hold your attention and people yeah, have to become um, interested in the storyline for that. So that's the point. Mm -hmm. The point and, is, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just uh, you you hook people with with whatever works, and then they get drawn into the actual um, the movie itself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the way. Um, mm -hmm. What was I going to say? Well, there was something that I was going to say. Um, oh, um, and I think I think I noticed a problem in the future with AI because mm -hmm. my phone, my new phone, it's just supposed to have, you know, semi AI or whatever, iPhone 14. Oh goodness. Yeah. Uh, it uh, it keeps finding photos of me and my girlfriend and then me and you from the movie and <laughs> and and it can't tell which one is real and which one is fake. So it's so oh. every day it serves the one or the other photos as the real as the real thing saying, "Oh, remember this memory because the, the iPhone uh, tries to show you your own photos from way back and tries to get mm -hmm. you to engage with the phone. Oh, I don't even, I mean, half the, half the photos that come up for me are, are like drawings, illustrations. Mm -hmm. So I don't even, I don't think of it as a, I don't, I, I mean, it's a different way. I mean, depending on what you yeah, have. My, my inner life is, is, is as much my life as what goes on in my day to day. So, so historians writing about us in a thousand years will be like, is this the real world or is this the fake one? So they'll be, well, I mean, we'll have biographies though. Sure, uh, sure. I mean, all of the, 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 um, the, Unless certain documents get destroyed and others survive, right. um, and, and this, also it's we would be world famous by then, so yeah. everyone would know our life stories. Yeah, it's a testament to how we frame the shots because yeah. the couple shots I take with Amanda and how I frame mm -hmm. okay. shots of the couple in the movie are similar, mm -hmm. and you guys look a little similar, so so the. Okay the AI system or the whatever system that program yeah. my, in my phone can tell the difference between <laughs> real couple images versus fake mm -hmm. ones. So that's good. I okay. found that to be very amusing. It could be All right. it could be a thread for a movie in the future. Okay. That yeah, like a, a reality. Right. The, right. These movies uh, already they deal with different realities. Right. Like in in a future movie uh, a character could be like, contact my girlfriend, then it, you know, goes through and tries to figure <laughs> out this one, this one. No, that's an actor. So, also, another thing re related to that, a um, lot of critics and some filmmakers are like, when I'm talking about the movie privately with them, uh, mm -hmm. more than once, like, you know, like every third discussion, they're like, oh, is that your real girlfriend? I'm like, no, man. Mm -hmm. So okay. I mean, you know, we're it, acting. It's uh, yeah. it, it works. That's that's what what acting is. You you use uh, experiences that you have in reality, and you you channel it, it into uh, the film. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. I'm glad yeah. that it came off realistic. Yeah, me too, me too, because we got okay. some complaints. We got some complaints after the first one saying the couple yeah. was real. So we worked on making mm -hmm. the second one, making those people real. So I think uh, some people have said that is part of the attraction of the movie, just hmm. being okay. uh, interesting, you know, some you know romantic, hmm. regular, right. you know, like a couple having a, a, an adventure because uh, 
lot of these movies, it's not a couple, it's just one character, hmm. from, you know, the adventure mm -hmm. world. Yeah. Yeah. Like, for me, it's, 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 um... I feel like for me, couplings tend to be very incidental. I don't like the focus to be on those in, in movies and books that I'm consuming, but that's just because, you know, that's me personally. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. For some people, they need that to be there for it to feel authentic. Yeah, so it, everyone's haven't... experience is different. Right, yeah, we haven't With... seen a lot of detective couples. In the next movie, in the next two movies, Renee and Allison will be doing, you know, Allison will be doing more detective work. So okay. that'll be interesting. Kind of like X-Files towards the end. Okay. That will be fun. Um, I have to say because um, I'm an artist in real life. So it's Obviously, fun to play somebody fun. who's focused on something that isn't right. the creation of art. It's more of an acting challenge in a way because i i feel like allison and i are are similar in that we're both artists, artists driven yeah. to create things yeah, so it'll be right. interesting to play someone who's more just really driven by solving a mystery right i mean it'll still be the same character except in this mm -hmm. division she's also a uh, assistant detective uh, nice yeah i'm not a real detective in the in real life so i just play one well, neither am I, but I find it, uh, you know, it's fun to play. It's fun to play characters who are very different than me. Yeah, it's, yeah. uh, it's, well, it, it gives me about. more of a challenge. I like it. So. Awesome. That's what acting is all about. You. Yeah, you do a really good job. And, uh, thank you. The past three movies we, we worked on, and we're about to make two more. So, all right. How are you finding, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about the movie becoming popular on YouTube? Um, it's kind of, it, it happened very quickly. Um, I feel like this, this movie, you only put it up about two months ago, right? Yeah, early March, March 2nd. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's been, um, a very, and that, that's often how it, I mean, if you're really lucky, that's how it happens. You put something out and then it, it just kind of um, snowballs into people noticing it. And yeah, I've been I, I stuff think... on YouTube since 2006, maybe? Yes. So it, it's it's the product of, you know, it's a, a buildup, which is uh, people aren't aware that that's how it is, that creators are making things for 20 years before they start getting really noticed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think we're on track awesome. uh, to, you know, keep, keep making movies and, yeah. and uh, be successful at it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm excited about that prospect and, um, you know, it, it's very, it's, uh, it, it's validating for people to notice. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the movies and and appreciate just just everything that that is going into it and this p particular sort of humor and dynamic and uh, so yeah I'm happy to be involved thank you awesome yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it makes uh, all the prep work and all the day jobs and many <laughs> days of filming and editing uh, worth it to get yeah people recognizing uh, the work mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Of, the like, of the likes and dislikes about 95 percent i think we're at almost I... ten thousand likes that's an <laughs> insanely high number for one of our projects <laughs> uh, it's definitely um the thing that i um i've been seen in the most awesome on the internet now <laughs> yeah we're uh, of the likes and dislikes uh over 95 percent are likes i mean likes versus hey. dislikes. so i mean that's amazing yeah it is <laughs> it's 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 a uh, hey good stuff Definitely. yeah keep uh yeah. keep the onward momentum that's the plan yeah eventually i yeah. want millions and possibly billions of people to see this movie let's see yeah i'm planning i, I uh, see why not yeah, why not? Get it out. Yeah.
planning uh, <laughs> lots of theatrical screenings, so I'll have more info on that soon. Sweet. And uh, let's see. Mike might join us at some point soon. It's six twenty, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll cut this down tight so that you know mm -hmm. only the good, good parts of the discussions are on there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, how do you like the process of doing uh, of having made two of this two of these movies? What were your thoughts during the making of it versus now? Um. It's uh well it's very interesting to see how how it all comes together because um due to my schedule being kind of restricted um usually usually I receive the script and then I have about a week to um I listen I record it um and I listen to it so I, I memorize my lines by listening just on uh, over and over the the I make myself an audiobook mm -hmm. basically um, awesome. so that's how I learn it and then we just we film everything within one or two days mm -hmm. um, like this uh, there were um, most of the days that we filmed for this last movie were um, the, the B-roll, like the walking around, um, the the romantic scenes, uh, just uh, Those were all really of, useful when I was editing. Yeah, yeah, no, but but all of that was filmed long time ahead, long before. Yeah. yeah, over the course of several days, and that that was the longest amount of filming, mm -hmm. and it was just you know it was very chill. Um, it was just, just, just walking around, um, uh, around Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, filming here and there. Yeah, and, I'm gonna do um, that for, the, uh, for all the upcoming movies also. Uh, yeah. That, that process of, uh, you know, slowly getting started is mm -hmm. useful to me, and also that footage yeah. is very useful when I'm editing. And mm -hmm. Mike has joined us. Hello, Mike, film critic. Hello, how are you doing? Hello. Hi, Hi. how do you Hi. do? Nice Hello. to meet you. <laughs> Good to meet you as well. Yeah, M Mike is a fan of both movies. He's seen both. Thanks. Yeah. Now That's I've seen good. the second one twice now. So yeah. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> you just watched the second one? Yeah, I had to refresh my memory because it was so long ago since I'd seen it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, we were just good. talking about the process of making the movie. So Mike. Yeah. Um, the movie has gotten 200,000, no, 270,000 plus views now. Isn't that crazy? That's insane. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So how did you get it to, how did you get all those views? Um, so the platforms, once something is promoted a little bit, I think they test out to see if uh, a certain piece of content will resonate with a lot of their viewers and whatever does resonate they keep pushing it and pushing it until people don't want to watch it anymore so <laughs> a lot, lot of YouTube creators have told me that uh, or you know I've just saw their videos where they say you know they try for years then all of a sudden one you know one of their videos take off with the help of YouTube and then <laughs> you know, that affects the other videos also. So I'm seeing that effect also. So we, me and uh, Elio, we talked about this a little earlier. So I promote every day and I promote using blogs and social and some ads, a couple dollars here and there, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, Google, whatever. And uh, after about three months of doing that, um, YouTube started boosting and started promoting it to their users heavily and now the promotion that's done through YouTube is um, you know it's the biggest driver of traffic to the uh, to the to the movie so I think they try to show things that people will like so that the creator is happy and the and the audience is happy and advertisers are happy so this just got lucky you know they just figured out a way to show this to people that mostly like it hmm yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's amazing that you've gotten this many views. It's uh, it's definitely a comedy that uh, 
it likes to embrace sort of like you know like there's these high stakes in the movie you know we don't know if these immortal time travelers are gonna you know blow the world up or not <laughs> and we and there's talk of like nuclear weapons being used but everyone's just talking about it nonchalant like yeah that might happen because well i think well because uh according to your character sajiwa is the happiest man in north america yeah renee uh, yeah. yeah 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 renee is the happiest man in north america and so yeah <laughs> so how did you find like the tone of your film then like how did you just like figure out if you wanted to make a comedy or something that was like you know broad comedy or something that was more kind of like indie comedy if that makes sense yeah that makes sense uh, indie comedy i think what you mean is sort of the laid back uh deadpan type humor that's in the movie mm -hmm. uh, that for me is easy to do and that's the kind of stuff i enjoy i don't really like over-the-top comedy with laugh tracks and you know oh yeah and laughs trying to be clowns but it works in some cases like roberto benini does that really well but uh, yeah i like more low-key comedy where you don't even know if it's comedy until a little later right yeah that makes sense it makes sense uh so like yeah, when 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 were you filming this movie again this is like two years ago was this during the pandemic no, this one was, uh, the first one was during the pandemic. This one was in 2022. And Aliyah okay. was saying when we started, um, you know, I hadn't really settled on exactly what kind of story, tone, and how to tell it. So we hung out a lot, uh, took walks in the parks and in the city, filmed it, just to get the characters, the character chemistry right as a couple, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and then during the editing, I realized, oh, some of these, you know, when you're editing, you sometimes, you know, run things backwards or, you know, just, just the, you know, you're an editor. So uh, sometimes the, you know, the timeline shows things running backwards because you're moving the cursor. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Aaliyah walking backwards and all the traffic going backwards is interesting. And hey, it's about time travel. Let's <laughs> connect it. <laughs> right. Right now, do you how do you how do you think do you think they use time travel too much in movies or just enough? Because like every film I see, like if there's one thing you know when we talk about, I know you guys mention the Marvel movies a lot. If there's one thing that annoyed me with Avengers Endgame. It was another time travel plot, mm -hmm. but this one doesn't seem to like. This one's more of like a backdrop, where or not a backdrop, but more of a thing you talk about than actually see in the film. Have you ever thought about actually doing science fiction? Uh, well, I'm calling this science fiction comedy, but, uh, you know, about the first part of your question, time travel or any device like that is good if you have a tight story where, you know, it's where it makes sense, where it's not too loose, right? Mm hmm But, uh, yeah. like, like, if everything that happens is a dream sequence or everything that happens can be undone with time travel, then... <laughs> kind of a meaningless experience so right uh, on this one the time travel is sort of in the background it's mostly the comedy you know trying to figure out what's happening um yeah i mean uh the next one is about a bunch of missing spaceships the next one's about a huh. ufo the one after that is about a ufo sex cult so i'm gonna do my own brand of science fiction where it's science fiction background but the scenes are comedy dramas yeah, that's awesome so what what like i've noticed this is kind of like uh slow cinema in a way what kind of draws you to that category of film uh good good question alia how do you like uh how did you like discovering slow cinema through these movies that i made i feel like it's something that i was introduced to before um but I can't tell you exactly what the films were. Mm -hmm. um, I went, I took history of film in uh, a college course and some of the movies we watched, I, you, you bring them up, I feel. Um, some, some of the old movies that we watched, um, but I'm forgetting. It was a French director who you were talking about. Um, but Godard. what's that? Maybe Godard? Possibly. 
I'm mm. not sure. In any case, um, I don't I don't remember, but I to me I just I really enjoy that um off kilter, it's just very like low key, is this a joke or isn't it? Mm. Um not being exactly sure like if the character is joking or not uh, but just sort of playing this absurdist scenario just very in a very serious nonchalant way um, it, it it is very different than anything I've done before because um, uh, I actually came into Sudiwa's project after um, I'd say about five years of, of not acting at all and before that I was doing more um, like I was doing theater in college and stuff like that so yeah, um, it, it's very different. Down. We have to get you to tone down on the hmm? uh, we have to get you to tone down on the you know expression yes uh, on the expressive <laughs> nature of the how yeah. we're being delivered. My my main note, especially in the first movie, was um, bring it bring it down a few notches. <laughs> not 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 so theatrical. Yeah, exactly. So it was um it, it was a different experience. I learned a lot about film acting, um, and uh, just um, I I I think I I've, I've become a lot better at subtlety mm -hmm. and improvisation yeah. because um yeah, like. Yeah. So, um, no, it, it's been a really good experience doing these movies. And um, Sujiwa is very, uh, just very laid back in his approach. Um, like, always knows exactly what we're going to do on the day that we're filming. But it's very, um, it's not it doesn't feel like a high pressure situation. It feels, uh, you know, just like I'm hanging out with a friend. It's good. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I like the, yeah, I like the, all that. And I like the, the, so the success, you know, the success or failure of most films depends on tone and tone mm -hmm. is very tough for a lot of new directors to master mm -hmm. because I saw, uh, Chris Pine's Cool Man, and uh, the tone is like, you know, it's crazy. Most people are not going to enjoy that movie because it's like five movies going on at the same time, right? So, close yeah. uh, forces you to bring everything down to a level, to sort of an even level, uh, so that it works, so that everything works, and things are more subtle, and things are happening slowly, the story, the movies being told slowly so that kind of presentation is great for comedy because uh, mm -hmm. it's a serious presentation but you know absurd comedy can live in that really well so that's why I like that style Mike but uh, in the future I'm gonna have slow cinema still but the shots will be shorter and the, thus the movie will feel like it's faster Right. I, I was actually thinking when I was watching this, it kind of reminded me, because you were mentioning Godard, uh, it sort of reminded me a little bit of Goodbye to Language 3D, where you see these long kind of panoramic shots of things. But like in that film, they're using a 3D camera just so they could show like a long image of like a leaf going by or, you know, two people walking around naked. Uh, your film has sort of the same thing where it's filming for a while, but it doesn't take like cinematic shots of things. Like it'll be, it'll like actually have you zooming into the buildings and zooming out while mm -hmm. still recording instead of cutting to yeah. that scene. Yeah. I was wondering what the intention was behind sort of like those sequences. Um, no, these are filmmakers who, you know, experimental underground indie filmmakers. So in my head, some of those shots are some of the shots that Allison would make, and it brings, you know, the zoom, the zoom in and out shots bring more uh, more energy to the movie, whereas the conversation scenes are usually from a you know from static angles, locked off cameras. So I just like uh, the shots that you know I think I picked it up from Battlestar Galactica, where. <laughs> 
what they have you know they're trying to show they shot that tv show like it's a documentary where the cameraman doesn't know what to focus on and within the shot it changes focus that i found to be very interesting um it, it changes the zoom and focus you know where the camera is pointing so i like uh that style it adds more energy to the movie yeah yeah so uh how is i'm just gonna think of it <clears throat> i'm just trying to think of a question i didn't know i was gonna be like the only critic on here today <laughs> okay. i'm gonna cut it up i'm gonna cut it up and i have a lot of uh this is not live and i have a lot of other uh things to bring up um so in the next movie we're gonna see uh the case is going to be uh, the detective and the Allison will be a detective in the next one also the case is going to be um there's 53 missing spaceships from different parts of the world and they were brought to new york now they've gone missing so uh the 53 the main story of the next movie will be Allison and renee discussing each one of these 53 cases so there'll be well, i might get elias help with designing some spaceships we might actually make some model spaceships and uh, some wacky conversations about uh about aliens from 53 different galaxies so that's nice. what i'm working on now oh nice nice that sounds fun <laughs> awesome so uh, that, go ahead no i'm go no go ahead you're still saying something then we'll take one movie one case per movie starting with nyc ufo sex cult which will have to do with the you know each of the cases that we discussed in the next movie in the in the 53 spaceship so each of the following 50 some movies will be about will be tied to one of those spaceship stories <laughs> that's crazy so yeah how how do you come up with the with the concept of each film then like how is it like okay this one's going to be about immortal time travelers this one's going to be about a sex cult that travels around in spaceships <laughs> <laughs> well i mean at the time of writing or at the time of writing shooting finishing up a script i look at what i'm interested in and what other people might enjoy and i put together a story so uh yeah. you know time travel was in the air when i was finishing up uh, the, the script for uh you know discussions of time travel i think probably heavily influenced by marvel movies um and uh, also you know whatever story you're trying to tell you just find interesting devices right you're like oh you know making this a sci-fi or detective story would make it easy or easier or, and interesting ultimately <laughs> you have to come up with something that other people find interesting and you find your you find interesting so you can work on it endlessly for months on end. Yeah, amazing man. So, uh do you Now, nah, that's a stupid question. I'm looking at my questions and I'm like, wow, why the no, fuck did I write that? that? <laughs> uh, it might uh, not be. Yeah, no. I was going to ask uh do you think filmmaking is magical and why is it? Yeah, that's not that's not a stupid question that's an interesting question <laughs> and work on it well i mean it's amazing that filmmaking works at all that you know that some story that you wrote that you put together with some shots you know res resonates with you know uh people around the world that you've never met right mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's a language and a tradition that makes that possible you know cinematic language but i think when you look at it uh, all the work that goes into it and what has to work there's a magical aspect to it when it works well when it yeah. doesn't work well it's you know it's painful for everyone yeah yeah how's how's that how's that like atmosphere throughout your career kind of like trajectized itself so that's even a word you know because yeah yeah because when you look at the trajectory of it i think you were talking to me like on a pod that we were doing way back and you said like you'd work on some sets and you wanted to go with a lower like sort of like crew set where it's just you and the camera mm -hmm. like what kind of drove you to do it like film movies that way um i think well earlier we were making movies kind of in a normal way uh, when we were making werewolf we had a sound person 
you know, we had different sets, different actors. Then in 2020, we were forced to invent a new way to make a movie and Aaliyah was a big help. And we figured out that just the two of us, if we take our time, we can shoot something and uh, get my acting up to speed and make something that works for people. So it was really making uh, the Sacred Society for Slow Romance during the pandemic that made me realize, oh, there's a much less stressful way to make these movies. And now we're adding more layers. Uh, you know, next movie will be faster. It'll be like, it'll be more like a regular comedy with some sci-fi elements. Renee movie was uh, sort of in between. When you see the next one, you'll see. So Renee movie will be like sort of in between the next one and uh, and the slow romance as far as pace, speed, amount of comedy, right? So it's just a process of discovery. You have to figure out what works best for you as an artist. Right. Absolutely. So Aliyah, I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but how did you and Sajiwa end up like meeting up and working together? Uh, I actually found um, it was for Werewolf Ninja Philosopher. I went to audition for uh, the role of the killer, actually, because uh, <laughs> that was um, the one that was being advertised that I saw on um, Backstage Magazine. So I actually was just at, at answering a backstage ad. So I went in for an audition and um, I didn't get that role, but he liked me as an actor. So um, I don't believe that the character of Sky was originally in the script he was working on. So he kind of put that character in and gave her a relationship with the werewolf. Um, so I and I was in that movie, and that's how uh, how we met and started working together. And then for uh, the Secret Society for Slow Romance, originally that was another actor who became unavailable, um, who was supposed to play Allison. So I uh, he he called me um, when she became unavailable, and I was like, okay, because uh, I I was. I work as a lab technician during the day and I was doing that during the pandemic, but um, mm -hmm. on the weekends I wasn't doing anything. So we we filmed that over the course of maybe five weekends in a row. And um, and yeah, that, that movie worked out. It worked out well and uh, he wrote the sequel and so I'm... I, it's it's kind of cool to uh, establish a working relationship with a, a filmmaker and um, being involved in uh, in the projects. Um, so you know, I'm I'm happy that worked out, uh, and yeah, good stuff. Um, if I sound a little muffled, it's because I'm recovering from a snap-related injury uh -oh. that I acquired last week. So, my tongue is still a little. Uh, <laughs> I didn't notice anything. <laughs> Good. Okay, I feel it more than it's probably audible. Right, right. The audio is picking up fine. Uh, so yeah, it's um, yeah. I have a funny story about the one of the actors. I mean, uh, Slow Romance went through a couple of potential leads, and uh, because of the delays in getting the script ready. Uh, the one actress got busy, too busy by the time I was ready to film. And the second one that was selected, and this was during the early days of the pandemic, and she was like, well, I'm not really sure if it's safe to do this kind of a movie where we're in a room talking, you know, we might get sick, blah, blah, blah. So she wasn't confident. Mm. Uh, you know about doing the doing the movie. I was like, well, you know, then don't do it. And I called Aaliyah and said, listen, we have an opening for this movie. Do you want to do it? She's like, sure, let's try it. I think both of us had gotten some of our shots by them, and uh, and we were, you know, we were like, well, if we die, I guess, uh, you know, 
we died doing uh, trying to do something that we like doing yeah. so uh, so yeah well, it's, it's really um she's really reliable you know she learns lines fast and she's available she's been available whenever i really needed her so that's why Aaliyah keeps uh, uh coming back to my movies yeah that's that's usually how the best collaborations work <laughs> you know yeah. like yeah, how many also, times have you sorry yeah. Go ahead. And I'm glad that she's not a famous actress yet. She's very good. <laughs> yet. She's very good, and a lot of directors don't know that. So <laughs> I can keep listening her into my projects and and bring in all the Aaliyah talent. Um, <laughs> my ideal situation is to get to know a lot of local actors uh, from all different backgrounds and stay in touch with them and, you know, hang out with them, you know, uh, outside of work, and then have just a community of people that I can call on whenever I need to shoot something. And it's going to be a lot. I mean, uh, some, you know, some filmmakers have figured out how to make a lot of movies fast. So I'm gonna be using their methods to, you know, crank out a lot of movies with us, without sacrificing quality. So hopefully eventually we'll have a community of actors and filmmakers in New York, like, you know, working together just as Aaliyah and I have worked together over the last few years. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, you guys have been really uh, making some pretty funny stuff together. I think like you both definitely have a lot of chemistry on camera. Were you guys a little nervous about doing some of the more romantic scenes at all? Or <laughs> how yeah, did that had, pan out? Yeah, we had, uh, <laughs> I think her mom was saying about the first movie that we didn't look like a, we didn't look like a couple. So, yeah. So for the second one, we hung out a lot shooting the B-rolls and just got became comfortable, you know, hanging out well, with each other and I think that helped. I mean, for me the it, it, it doing that sort of a scene is it's it's always uncomfortable. Um cuz it, it's just it's um it's yeah, exactly. And that's that's known just uh, it, acting those kind of scenes is is it's not you you have to make it very much look like you know, you feel very much at home in the scenario even if you don't necessarily. So, you know, it's um it's it's just sort of you you have to get yourself into the character's mind so you and know you have to prep and there's a lot of filmmaking trickery involved i mean uh you know some of the a lot of the romantic scenes you sh you see just a few seconds of kissing or making out and then other shots and a lot of the you know it could one scene could be made up of shots shot over a number of months, you know, and music. So there's a lot of trickery involved in making those feel, you know, naturalistic. But the making of those things are always tough. You have to make yeah. sure. It, you know, and I'm not like, I'm not a very, I'm just naturally not a touchy feely person. It took like, it, it took, it takes me a while to be comfortable hugging like mm. anybody at all so <laughs> you know yeah. but it's I'm the you, same it, way so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um yeah i don't like all... yeah i don't like uh too much affection <laughs> any, either in in like real life <laughs> yeah yeah like the only time i'm real affectionate and touchy-feely is when i've had a few drinks in me but like outside <laughs> of that like i'm i'm very reserved nice but, yeah, like we're, we we film these scenes and then we say goodbye to each other with fist bump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's interesting, just you know, acting um, relationships. But um, you know, uh, it's a uh, it's work. Uh, exactly, your work. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, one of the things I've discovered is um, just talking to audiences. They like seeing romantic stories. A bunch of people mm -hmm. like it. Uh, or romantic elements in other stories. So so that's, I think, what has made the uh, Renee movie a success because we were able to sell the relationship aspect in a really good way. Thanks largely to Aaliyah's acting. I'm just reacting. So, uh, yeah. 
So yeah, it's just it's just filmmaking work. You have to prep, shoot, and then edit things with music in a way where it comes off com it, it uh, comes off authentic and real. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, how do you deal with the world of distractions when trying to be creative? Because I think you were talking about that at one point in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think Aaliyah was talking about that uh, as Allison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You can answer that um, first, Aaliyah. Well, for me, unfortunately, it's difficult because uh, I have a, a full-time job where I'm, I'm uh, focusing on something that isn't artistic at all. And, um, you know, at the moment, it's it's stable, and I'm holding on to it until um, until I more really start bringing in more for more movies, and um, just regular. I I'm also um, getting involved in in live DJing, so that I'm hoping to do that professionally soon as well. I'd much rather be an actor, DJ, singer, than um, I don't know work as. Uh, a mad scientist which i do right now but um whatever pays the bills exactly pretty much um as long as you're not in the coronavirus laboratory in wuhan china you should be okay well no um <laughs> we, actually, we we still we get we get covid swabs though um but i i don't have to open them right um, <laughs> so the question but, uh, is how, it, do you how do you focus on the artwork uh the thing is i i always have something going on in the background like the, when when i have a little downtime at work um i'm often um uh, i'm i'm putting together a song on the garage band app um or, on or my phone nice, right? uh, i've actually come up with a, a few of my new songs that i'm going to put out probably next year uh on my phone before i transfer them into my more sophisticated program so i'm able to try and keep up creative projects um even if i'm out and about um and you learn lines at work right exactly the same thing if i if i'm memorizing the lines for a movie um like when i when i receive the the script for the next movie um i'm going to uh I record everything before I go to work um, as if it's an audiobook and I do different voices um, for I've I've actually been doing for Allison I do my regular voice and then I do my best impression of Alan Rickman for uh, for <laughs> Renee Mr. and that's just the voice that I use to separate and it, it's um it's very silly but it's fun to listen to and that's how i learn my lines when i'm at my job because i'm able to split my attention and still focus on what i'm doing in order to learn the lines so um that allows me to stay creative and sane while i'm doing other work awesome. and um yeah yeah i think uh, you won't have to work your day job for too long because Oh, if, I get, if I get my 50 movies happening and we need you as yeah. a busy, yeah. uh, you'll, uh, you'll be able to make some money doing a bunch of acting work. Uh, that would be excellent. That's, and, uh, that's the goal. Awesome. And uh, I try to stay focused. Uh, well, for a number of years now, most of my week is spent on film work. Uh, like, and it's like I have two jobs right i'm doing a lot of film work whenever possible and then i do some work for clients to bring in additional money needed and uh fundraising you know so it feels like i'm always doing some version of fundraising either working for clients or direct fundraising for movies and then i'm writing directing or editing so you know ultimately movies have to get done so you just find the time and you do it yeah yeah so how do you think uh do you think we're a little too because your movie's independent but do you think as a culture we're a little too pop culture obsessed where there's a lot of people who maybe aren't interested in cinema as much as they should be 
I think, uh, well, it's difficult to tell right now because so many people are into so many different things, promoted through so many different avenues. Um, I just find that there's more interest in indie movies now, especially through YouTube and VOD, not so much theatrical. But, so I find that to be a positive thing. Yeah. So, uh, oh, you're, you're <laughs> Oh, so when you when you film the no, let me skip that for a second. Mike Sorry. actually prep some prep prep some questions. I'm like it's Sunday. I'm gonna go get some coffee and just you know uh, wing it. So yeah, uh, well yeah, I have a lot of questions that I asked from before is the thing because <laughs> yeah, I didn't know how many people were gonna be on the panel. No, but no, but uh, one person couldn't make it. And I, a couple other people could make it uh, Sunday, you know, unplanned things happening. So ask all your questions, Mike. I'll cut it up so that the the show looks nice. Okay, great. So yeah, because I'm maybe it's just live. it's not a live presentation. All right. So uh, what is the immortal time traveler? Who are they, and what do they want? Because I think you might have said what they were in the film, but I don't know if that counts as a spoiler or not. Um, I'll, without giving too much away, yeah, we, you know, Renee comes to a conclusion at the end of the movie about who they are and what they might want. But, uh, you know, other people may come to different conclusions. So it's, it's in the movie. Uh, so we won't give away exactly for people who haven't seen it. Much of the world has not seen the movie yet. We're not at billions of views yet. So yeah. Right. So how are these immortals time traveling in your film? Like in your theory, what could have happened in one dimension has happened when the light bridge like came out? Like how did that all start? So I think, uh, I mean, you know, as the person who wrote the script, putting, putting this together. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the, I think Renee talks about it in the movie. The light bridge is the result of uh, whatever technology these time travelers are using to go between uh, time periods. So the theory is time exists as discrete slices, like slices on a bread on, on a bread loaf, right? You know how mm -hmm. different slices. So, you know, let's 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 say today is one slice and yesterday was another slice. Ten years ago is another slice. So the light bridge uh, connects people through those slices of time. Yeah. And uh, and I needed something visual to show this time travel. So the so I created the light bridge, you know, creating this, you know, sort of this fiery glow whenever it's being used. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. I noticed much of your time uh, in the film is just seeing Allison join the scenery. It helps us look into the audience of the film, or I should say Aaliyah, I'm sorry. But that was her character name, Allison, right? Yeah, Allison. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank God. We don't have to cut that part. All right. <laughs> uh, but no, much much of it is Allison enjoying the scenery and it helps uh, the audience uh, kind of soak in the atmosphere of the film. What what attracts you toward that towards that sort of reserved style? Uh, well, uh, in this movie, that's supposed to be uh, <clears throat> image glimpses from different dimensions. So if you look really carefully, and I was talking to another podcaster, uh, he said he was watching it with a friend and at one point he pointed out oh this is one of those uh backward scenes and the friend is like no everything is happening backwards he's like no not everything's happening backwards so they went <laughs> back to the, so they restarted the movie and tried to figure out what's happening backwards <laughs> and what's happening normal time right so uh in a similar way the uh shots in between conversation scenes are supposed to be glimpses of different different dimensions 50 of them or whatever that has its own allison and its own renee but you know their stories and their world might be slightly different um, right. so as far as using that style of you know using lengthy uh transition shots uh that came from slow cinema from i think werewolf i used that a lot slow romance i used that a, a, quite a bit to uh, differentiate between the conversation scenes and the, you know, just go from one conversation to, scene to the next. 
For an A movie, we're using it as different dimensions. There'll be some of that in the next movie, but probably not as much. Right. Now, so how do you think the, to switch subjects a bit, how do you see the current state of film criticism? Because you mentioned something in the movie about colonialism effect, affecting film criticism, which I never even thought about. But <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you gave me a little more info on that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a very broad and deep subject. So about the colonialism issue, right? Uh, <laughs> People in every country are taught to think a certain way. So people mm. in Iran, people in rural Iran, people in urban Iran, people in New York City, people in Sri Lanka, let's say urban Sri Lanka, these four groups will see the same world in four different ways. Uh, you know, influenced by religion, Islam, influenced by Buddhism, in the U.S. influenced by capitalism and uh, notions of freedom. So, so all this background stuff factors in when you're analyzing a work of art. So an American film critic may assume that it's normal that almost every character in a movie is white looking and there's no African looking people. Mm. South Asian looking people, mm -hmm. oh, Native American people, right? But that reality of the movies is a thing from the 1950s that came together due to 50s, 40s, 30s, that came together due to segregation in the US, right? Mm -hmm. Extend that they didn't have black actors sharing uh, you know, lead roles with white actors was 100% due to segregation. Hollywood couldn't show those movies in the South. I mean, they were banned from showing something like that. So that kind of thing has persisted where, you know, to someone who doesn't know, someone just born in America and looking at movies would think, oh, that's just normal. You know, just all white people movies is just normal, right? Same thing in uh, Sri Lanka, right? Um, seeing the world portrayed just using Sri Lankan people, they would think it's normal. Whereas, you know, in the actual world, there's much more diversity. So that's what I meant by colonialism affecting uh, film criticism. Yeah. So, uh, a white film critic or a black film critic in America would 100% be affected by American history. And the yeah. second, the second uh, question, uh, the second aspect was about film criticism now. I think a lot of film critics don't like a lot of movies. I think we need sort of a film appreciation hmm. group of critics, especially to help the indie movies. Like even Chris Pine, who's a famous uh, in a Hollywood actor, when his first movie, Pool Man, came out, people trashed it. And I saw the movie. It's not that bad. It's just, a, it's just an okay first-time movie. There's flaws in it, but, you know, you can't crush every movie that comes out because then there'll be no more movies. That's true. I mean, there's a lot of classics that have been slammed by critics. I think critics have initially hated Fight Club. Mm -hmm. And now as the years have gone on, they've come to appreciate it a little more. Roger Ebert famously hated it. I mean, th there's a lot of films you could go down where you're like, oh, yeah, you know, that was appreciated years later. I mean, one film that the critics really hated, because I just saw the Megalopolis news, right. is Youth Without Youth. I thought I that, I saw it way back, like around when it came out. And I thought, right? yeah, it was just, it was just like on one of the cable channels and I just watched it straight through. And I mean, that's how I discovered a lot of films. I discovered Christopher Nolan and Memento just from watching that movie on one of the movie channels. Awesome. But yeah, Youth Without Youth was actually like, it was trashed by critics. And I saw it, I'm like, this is actually kind of a unique, interesting love story that yeah, it involves time travel, but not in the way you would usually think. Right. But yeah, it's it's kind of funny how critics could be, they said it in, uh, to, in, to reference all movies in Adam Sandler film and Big Daddy, where they what? say, where they had the little kid says, uh, Critics are cynical assholes in it. And I'm like, well, that that's true for some of them, but not all of them, you know? Yeah, I think, but, I think the culture needs, uh, American culture needs 
a group of critics who are big fans of movies and are supportive of indie filmmakers because unlike a Hollywood movie, when an indie film gets done, if it gets even like three or four bad reviews from big critics, that's going to kind of crush the movie, right? Then that, mm-hmm. then uh, that filmmaker can't find the resources to make a second movie, third movie, fifth movie, and improve their craft, which means down the road we'll have less interesting filmmakers. Uh, Aliyah, I... how, do you like the exp- how did you like the exposure to various uh, film nerd aspects of the world through my movies? Oh, I absolutely enjoyed it. Going back to what you were mentioning uh, just before this, though, I think it's very important uh, when you're watching a movie or appreciating any piece of uh, artwork or media to appreciate it for what it is, to try and sort of see like, okay, this is is a sci-fi comedy. This is a love story. This is a science fiction dystopia and sort of not like it. And the same thing goes for any kind of art. If you're listening to um, or if you're looking at at, uh, Monet, don't judge it as if it's a um, like a a very precise realistic painter um and appreciate it's important if you're critiquing something to be looking at it for what it is and what it's trying to be um and not trying to not saying i appreciate this kind of art and this kind of art only and i'm gonna judge everything else by that standard so i wanted to say that about this but no i i liked um it, it was fun to play a um an artistic person who whose concentration was on something that I don't concentrate on, which is uh, the um, the actual like filmmaking side of making movies. Um, so that was fun just to talk about um, a lot of uh, filmmaking lingo and uh, and um, <clears throat> just uh, you know uh, memorizing things like. Uh, in the first movie, I'm saying, like, this is what a superhero movie would look like filmed by this director, something, yeah, something millimeter, <laughs> this, this, and and sort of like those things. And I, I, they didn't really make sense to me, but it's like this makes sense to Allison. She knows all about this and how to reproduce it. So it's um, uh, I felt I learned some just some things vicariously through Allison about filmmaking. So that was good. Awesome, yeah. It's a super film nerd stuff, super mm-hmm. indie underground film stuff that I don't see uh, or didn't see at the time reflected in the movies a lot. And because most movies are Hollywood movies. They're not focused on that stuff. So I thought it would be an interesting thing to add to the, just for the general public, for the culture. Uh, you know, because there's this whole other way of making movies, especially popular in New York, popular in France, popular in lots of countries, that is not Hollywood, you know, that Hollywood looks kind of crazy in comparison to how indie movies are done and how they look and feel, right? Uh, Right. A a critic friend of mine was saying last night uh, on Twitter, a lot of... uh, Film, a lot of some critics are baffled by Popola's new movie Megalopolis. I think you were talking about that also. Also, your phone, your mic is turned off. According to oh, I know. Okay, good. I didn't want my ringing phone to. Oh sure, no problem. <laughs> no, problem. no problem. Anyway, my a critic friend was saying uh, people are saying how come uh, Megalopolis do- doesn't play like a regular movie, right? So. And, and he was saying, and and I agree that there's no one, you know, just because Hollywood does things a certain way, that that doesn't mean that's the only way you could do it. Lots of other people tell movies, tell stories in lots of different ways. So I wanted to focus on the diversity in filmmaking that's out there that a lot of people may not know about. Um, so. What do you think, because you, you talked a lot about this in the film, what do you think can connect us more to each other in the universe? Because you, 
you kind of make the uh, the statement that you know people overall are okay, you know, but we just need to find a way where we can have world peace. So I know it's kind of a heavy question, but since you brought it up in the film, mm-hmm. just wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, I think uh, people worldwide, most people, not the crazy power hungry people or artists, but most people want peace. They want to be left alone. They want to, they want work and money, food, obviously housing. And most people want to start a family and lead an interesting life. And I think across cultures, this is the same thing across time. So it's up to the leaders to facilitate that kind of a world. And I think we're mostly there, even though that's not reflected in the, in the media. The population is, is about 8 billion and less than 1% of those people in the world are involved in wars right now. So this is mostly a peaceful planet, except the media needs something sensational to talk about to get attention. Mm-hmm. So they focus on the wars. There's a war in Russia, Ukraine. There's a war in uh, Palestine, Israel. Then there's uh, you know minor skirmishes throughout the world in various places. Some small wars in Africa, and some you know some drug wars in Latin America. But mostly the world is at peace. Like like 99% of the people are not involved in wars. Uh, so economically, development is needed communication between just people in the U.S. and people worldwide are needed. So I think we're going to get there because so many people want a decent life without war. Yeah. I mean, how? I mean, recently uh, we were talking about how filmmaking doesn't like doesn't have a lot of diversity because of colonialism and because you always see the white uh, protagonists. How do you think it's changed recently? Like, do you still see too many white protagonists or has there been a little more diversity in film? Well, I mean, each country has a lot of people in the movies from the main ethnic group because the people want to, you know, the makers of the movie want, want to sell the movie to the majority group so it can make some money back, right? So mm-hmm. in India, you're going to see whoever, whatever group is in power, represented mostly in the Indian movies. But India has multiple industries. It's a weird country with uh, like a billion people. So let's see, in France, you'll see whoever's in power, mostly in the cast. Same thing with every other country, Iran, various African countries. So in the US, it has gotten a lot better since the 1980s because we have TV, we have VOD, we have the mm-hmm. Apple, we have lots, we have YouTube. So right now, anyone can make a movie, put it up on YouTube, and it might be seen by millions of people. So uh, the problem that existed in the 1980s, free Spike Lee, where all that most of the actors were white looking, and and also we, you know, there's another aspect of this which is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Jewish actors in Hollywood who look white, but they don't consider themselves to be white. And it's a non, you know, it's a, but it, you know, it's sold, you know, the movies were sold as white characters, blah, blah, blah. So, so movies have always been diverse, but with, in the U S with a lot of white looking people. Right. So that has ended largely, I think, uh, there, uh, so I think there's a lot more diversity now. Uh, in 2024, which is about 40 some years after Spike Lee's uh, breakthrough movies. When Spike Lee made some of those movies, he integrated uh, some of the unions, brought in African American workers because uh, he wanted a mixed uh, crew and a mixed cast for his movies, which makes sense. If you live in New York, uh, as Aaliyah and, and I do, yeah, it's very diverse here. Uh, Spike yeah, Spike Lee was probably like, "It's crazy. Why is it all white people?" <laughs> Let's yeah, bring in some to me, it it looks because I I've lived in New York City for so long. Um, I I notice more if a cast is not racially diverse because that's what I'm used to. 
I think it depends a lot on what you're used to and how mm -hmm. you react to the people on the screen. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you know, there. So it's yeah, all about think, your environment. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's gotten people better. These people. <laughs> I think the diversity issue has gotten a lot better. Yeah, it it seems to, and especially even behind the scenes now, we see a lot more woman directors working. We see a lot more black directors, Korean directors. All coming, one, you know, to Sri the front Lankan stage. American. Yeah, and one Sri Lankan American director. You know, uh, I know RRR was a huge hit in the yes, states. You know, they India. put, yes. yeah, for India. Yeah, that that was Ian Simmons. You know, just a quick shout out to him. That was his favorite movie, nice. I think, last year. I I think I actually agreed with him and made that my favorite movie too. Nice. But. Yeah, look, it's it's nice to see more directors from diverse, you know, uh, sides of the pool, because uh, recently I think one of my favorite movies I've seen this year is called I Saw the TV Glow, and that's through like a non-binary director, and they did an amazing job with one of the best films I've seen this year. Yeah, you know? Jane, Jane Schoberg, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. I... Yeah, I remember uh, that director when they were starting out a few years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's playing. I went to see Full Man, and it was playing in the same theater. So, yeah, I'm glad uh, indie movies from diverse backgrounds are getting attention. Um, so I think the big difference was the uh, Dogma ninety five switching to shooting on digital. Mm -hmm. Then. Digital is a much more affordable format, and then the web developing to such a degree with social media, YouTube. I mean, YouTube only came online in 2006. Only around 2020 uh, did releasing full-length features, indie features for free on YouTube became a norm, uh, partially due to the pandemic, and partially due to how difficult it is to release movies. Um, so. Digital video and the web development really helped with uh, diverse filmmakers being able to make and release stuff without having to go through Hollywood to get permission to make movies. Now anyone can make movies, so uh, no excuse for not making movies, even if Hollywood says so, people <laughs> will make movies. Right. You ever see Francis Ford that, Coppola? That rant sounds like something out of one of my movies. <laughs> you ever see Francis Ford Coppola's bit about yeah. He said it was, a, yeah, from, from uh, Hearts of Darkness, where he said, you know, one day some little girl from Ohio is going to film something on her grandfather's video camera. And from then, cinema is going to be destroyed, <laughs> you know. Yeah, which... that, day has, that day has arrived. There's a bunch yeah. of Western, Midwestern filmmakers who are making features. Some are making a feature a month, putting on YouTube. They're, they're getting a lot of Patreon support. Uh, yeah, I mean... There's a, you know, one aspect of film criticism right now is film critics are not focused on YouTube released movies. And I think they should look at those because yeah. that's the next, that's the next generation of directors. It, I, it could be, I mean, they, they still got to go through the studio system to actually have like, you know, movies, uh, go basically like whoever's the most popular one is going to get the attention from the studios. They might. You know, and and yeah. it's possible they may not sign up with the studios because, uh, yeah. you know, you can make VOD deals that get that get your movies on uh, Hulu, on uh, you know, on maybe Disney even on Netflix, on these um, huge sites. You may not, you know, some directors may never deal with the studios and still make movies that are seen by millions of people and still make millions of dollars. So it's a completely different world. The studio system, I think, uh, is really facing big challenges. And Paul Schrader was saying this at Khan a couple nights ago. Mm. That, you know, was it Paul Schrader? It, it sounds like some, like Paul Schrader usually says some kind of cynical no, things. <laughs> no, Coppola. Coppola, was, was Coppola. Uh, yeah, Coppola was saying that studios are in debt heavily in debt uh no was it couple i'm trying to remember who the director was who said this anyway some famous director said studios are heavily in debt uh, maybe it was paul schrader heavily in debt but uh, amazon and apple and netflix have money so 
next wave of movies may, may be financed, large movies may be financed by those people as opposed to studios as we knew them. Yeah, it's Coppola who said it. He slammed so, studio system after he self-financed Megalopolis. Execs don't make good movies, he said. Yeah, sure. And Jack was a great movie. No, it's, <laughs> it's well, funny. What do you... Yeah. It's funny, like, Coppola's movies haven't been that great for a while, although I will still argue for Youth Without Youth being pretty good. Nice. But the guy does the guy does make a point, even if, like, he's had some stinkers, you know, oh, because... I mean, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, something being good is a matter of taste. I mean, it's yeah. possible that the indie stuff that he's doing is very different from the Hollywood stuff that he was forced to do, right? When you take yeah. it from studios... You have to turn in something that they're happy with. As yeah. To self-financing, maybe he always wanted to do weird outsider movies like these, but you know he just had to do whatever to pay the bills back in the day. Aliyah, we right. we'll wrap up the uh, discussion soon. Uh, mm -hmm. How has being in the Renee and slow romance movies, uh, uh, you know, helped your creative career, acting career? and or life in general, are things better? Um, yeah, well, I have to say it, um, it makes me, when I'm working on, I'm one of those people who really doesn't feel fulfilled unless I'm working on a creative project or I'm promoting a creative project that I feel proud of. Mm -hmm. um, so this gives me another avenue for that, so it, it helps my self-esteem, I have to say, and it, it's made me just um, feel better about myself in general to be involved in these movies and now to have them doing well and finding their audience. Um, so that's been a really good experience. It gives me more confidence to um, uh, I haven't been focusing right now so much on uh, finding other acting jobs, but um, in the future, perhaps I, I still <laughs> I still have to make an IMDb page. I, I have to say it's a uh, down the road. Yeah, but um, so it, it gives me more confidence don't in myself as don't a performer in general. Good. So that carries into um, other other things that I'm doing creatively and. Um, you know, it, it feels good to be able to uh, tell people, yes, I am, in fact, a real actor. Right. Look at this. Right. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy about it. Um, don't, thank don't you again for involving me. Good. Don't get too busy with the acting work. Save time for the future, <laughs> the never ending well, yeah. Renee movie sequels. Uh, they're going to be 53. That's right. Or 50 Every spaceship. 50 yes. We've already made. Maybe. And then I might come up with other ideas that are outside of the Rene universe. So mm -hmm. uh, your weekends will be busy soon. Well, hopefully I'll have time um, during the week as well. Yeah, there you and, go. Um, uh, uh, this is all my art back here. Um, I'm going to draw some of the aliens. Awesome. And, and okay, good. The spaceships. Yes. Good. No okay, reason I can't draw. That's right. Yeah, we'll. He's drawing in one of the scenes. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Mike. Yeah. Uh, last couple of questions. Last couple of questions. Okay, I will fire them away. Sure. Uh, what? Uh, no, I said that one. Do you think independent film could help cure poverty, <laughs> like it yeah. says in the film? It can. Yeah, I mean, uh, not just not. In, I mean, this is this is something that I argue with, with argued with with Ian because he couldn't see the connection. Uh, not just not indie film, not just indie film, but any economic activity can help end poverty, right? You open up a movie theater in a town that doesn't have a movie theater. Some people get to work there, you know. The, you know, they have to bring in popcorn, you know, you know, bigger, you know. So, any activity, indie film or not, any business activity that generates money 
helps to end poverty. I mean, uh, yeah, so more, you know, American companies, wealthy people in other countries should just do more culture and arts activities, indie films, theaters, festivals, whatever, anything that helps people get more money. So yeah, ultimately uh, poverty will be ended through partially through employment, partially through something like uh, a guaranteed minimum income. Yeah. So I guess I could uh, end on this. You seem to run a very busy life. How do you find enough space where you can relax and you can work and you feel fulfilled? Um, I have a very simple life. Uh, You know, most of my life is focused on filmmaking and distribution and related work. And I, I've kind of organized my life that way, right? And uh, I live with my girlfriend, and that's, you know, that doesn't take up, you know, maintaining that relationship doesn't take up too much time. Uh, you know, you know, we do spend, you know, some time together every week. But she's busy with her writing work, so it's good. So, uh, you know, my advice to filmmakers or any artist is to make your life as simple as possible that'll open up more time for the artwork. I mean, the other stuff that I have to get done, I'm partially bored with, right? You know, just fundraising, whatever, and regular life maintenance stuff. So I'm most excited about the filmmaking stuff. So I try to get that stuff done and I have a lot of time for it because of how I've organized my life. Mm. Excellent. Well, well thanks thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for joining us for the celebration. Yeah. Up and post it up. Yeah. Mike, <laughs> where can people find out more about your writing and uh, other stuff? Oh, if you go to ypareviews.com, you can find me there. You can also find me on TikTok, uh, TikTok, TikTok at YPA Reviews Chicago. Awesome. So, but yeah, but basically anywhere. YPA stands for you'll probably agree. You can find me at YPA okay. Reviews anywhere. And on my website, ypareviews.com, I usually review about like two of the biggest movies that are coming out that week you know when they're coming out but i also do podcast material and like to support little indie projects like this so i'm not just constantly feeding the hollywood machine that's right and this project is uh, huge in certain parts of the world so uh, mm-hmm. we'll do the two million views celebration in a few months wow that would be amazing it's gonna be <laughs> crazy I'm gonna, yeah. keep, I'm gonna keep pushing it to see how widely and how far it could go that's what you gotta do you gotta keep pounding yeah. that seo that's right yeah thanks yeah. a lot for your support over the years mike and <laughs> of we'll, course anytime we'll send you the next movie Elia, any last words before we officially end the uh discussion oh and sorry oh. For, sorry for talking over things there's a delay in the uh reception so that's okay i i do the same um no just uh again thank you for having me in these projects um i'm I'm having fun yeah no i'm i'm having fun with them i'm i'm it's it's an experience watching them gain an audience and i'm glad i'm along for the ride and i'm looking forward to to learning about some aliens that's right some missing (laughs) spaceships that we have to find yes awesome all right alia stay on we're going to discuss the next project in a bit and Mm -hmm. i I will talk to you soon thank you for joining all right right. thank you it's nice meeting you too yeah all right thanks guys thank you you. (laughs) usually i'm very good about staying on top of twitter and texts and emails but somehow i completely lost track of the Twitter messages. That's all right. You, uh, I, I can tell from your feed, you're a busy guy, and it is incredibly difficult to offend me. All right, good. <laughs> good. All right, so uh, G- Giles Edwards, right, or is it Giles? Uh, Giles is yeah. Soft G is correct. Giles. All right. Giles Edwards, film critic, is joining us. You primarily write for Three Six Six Weird Movies. Yes, yes, I'm on hook with them for uh, average a review a week, 
but right. I do I do gear up considerably once a year every summer. Nice. And uh, where do you live? I live in Troy, New York. It's east side of the Hudson River. Oh, Used okay. to be. Yep. So you're east coast. I'm in Brooklyn. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I I uh, know very few areas of New York City, but I know know Brooklyn uh, quite a bit more than I used to. I, awesome. So, so yeah. come down, come for a visit, or when I when I when I go uh, in that direction, I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. No, that sounds cool. Yes, because you are, I think, only one. Depending on traffic, two to three hours away by car as we speak. Wow, it's a long time. I, not terrible. Short time for some. I understand that as you go further west, a four-hour car trip is like, oh, that's just your neighbor. But uh, I, I like the dense population of the Northeast myself. Awesome. All right. So we're talking about the Renee movie getting 200,000 plus views now at 276,000 or whatever. Uh, yeah, so let's discuss the movie. Did we ever do a show about the movie? Uh, you spoke with Greg some time ago. Um, just going to see if I can quickly find... Okay, Pod366 interview with the director. I wasn't there that day. And that was... Give me a date. Oh, nine months ago. Wow. Time flies. It uh, sure does, but I, I have seen the movie and awesome. I, I did re write the review. Awesome. So um, now is a chance for us to talk about the movie and also it getting crazy amounts of views on YouTube. Yeah, I've been following your process. Uh, combination of open mindedness and doggedness seems to uh, be doing the job for you there. Uh, plus, YouTube deciding uh, to promote that movie, apparently they're able to get a bunch of likes, like 95% uh, of the likes are positive. That is fantastic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There we go. That just started right up. Just checking the specs. Yeah, 270K. How long has it been on YouTube? Uh, a little over two months now. Uh, it was the March, March 2nd when I posted it up. Okay. Cool. I imagine you've got a whole world of numbers to look at. Is it, uh, you know, one of these great little, like, you know, shooting to the sky kind of lines? Yeah, it's it's like nothing. And then a little bit, the little bit comes from me doing uh, blogs and uh, mm -hmm. Twitter and some ads. I do a couple of dollars worth of ads, Facebook, wherever that that's all I can afford. Then it goes way up once YouTube decided they're going to show it to a bunch of their people. I think uh, my theory, I have no idea, no one does really. Uh, my theory is they look for things that a lot of people will, that they can show to will like so that the creator's happy, advertisers are happy, and the audience mm. is happy. And once they find something like that, they keep promoting it until it dies. I think that's what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> And uh, just, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, squeezing as much life out of that project while you work on your, uh, what, 53 things you have in the pipeline, if I remember the your... The next title is 53, uh, 53 uh, Hidden Ancient Spaceships. Oh, okay. Is this, uh, I, I imagine you're working in the larger universe of the uh, Disco Detective. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, well, all your output's kind of uh one foot in your reality at least mm -hmm. um so that uh is going to I, i'm going to presume expand on uh the danger being diffused from cosmic disco detective renee's case back whenever you made that was that two years ago now 22 23 it's an officially a 23 release i think i put it on vimeo vod in uh maybe August or September. Okay. Yeah, my review was September 2023. That must have been uh, August or September. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're going to be in a different dimension for the next movie. Each movie will be in a different dimension, but all the Renees and all the thousands of dimensions kind of have a similar life. So um, 
I'm using the different dimensions uh, paradigm so that each movie could be free to, you know, grow in various ways so that it's not limited by the previous movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's always nice when they are part of the same family, but not a uh, necessarily in sequence kind of thing. Yeah, yeah so. not the exact reality that we saw earlier. So do you have any questions and or comments about the movie? Well, I'm just uh, looking at, yeah, it's, it's been a while. I don't think I've seen it since, um, oh, I don't know, first half of December of 2023, but uh, dusting, off my, dusting off my cobwebs here, looking at my review. Yeah, it's one of those things that, uh, going back to your YouTube remarks, it's, uh, I, and don't take this the wrong way, because I know you have your various views on uh, Hollywood and the like, but uh, it's a it's a crowd-friendly movie, because it's doing a number of different things without, um, shall we say, forcing anyone, any particular of its elements on the viewer. Uh, in the best way I can think of, I think I probably even used the word breezy somewhere in my my remarks here. Um, so I, yeah, I'd regard it, I guess, as a film essay of sorts, because there is that narrative structure. Uh, but as far as I could tell, that was just a uh, convenient excuse to do a handful of things. Uh, one of what one of my favorites being. The, I think it was always just like a side view of uh, Cosmic Disco Detective Rene staring off this way, doing this thing, and uh, musing over his various theories of what these future people are getting up to. Now, you do a number of uh, plot possibilities in those, you know, half dozen sequences with about, I don't know, two or three um, remarks each time. Do you uh, plan on exploring? Uh, any of those, uh, particularly the the bears one, I, I recall very fondly. Yeah, uh, the movie, it's got a lot going on. And I think part of the popularity is it's, you know, it's got a lot going on. And I see a lot of people returning, unlike for my other movies on YouTube and elsewhere. A lot of repeat viewers, people watch a part of it, they go away, they come back, watch a little bit more they come back so there's a lot of repeat viewings um i mean re you know people coming back to it uh not, maybe not watching the entire thing several times but watching stopping and coming back mm -hmm. so i think that's because there's a, there is a lot going on and uh one critic that i talked to a couple of days ago said uh, uh yeah they couldn't you know uh, they had a hard time getting into it because there was so much going on. But they're gonna watch it the second, uh, watch it the second time. And uh, I mean, they're used to like John Wick type movies where there's like, you know, you know, just a few. Like they're used to watching a movie and having a conversation with someone else and doing a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, not for this movie. To get this movie, you have to pay lots of attention to it. And but they had a good time watching it with their yeah. Friends. And I think, yeah, I think what you say is true there. Uh, it uh, does require attention, but simultaneously thinking on it now, I think it's also like very chunkable, uh, the way you mentioned that people would watch it a bit, then come back to it later. It's the kind of thing where the uh, the pacing is such and the style is as such that, uh, you know, okay, you watch, you know, 15, 20 minutes of this, paying attention to it, uh, otherwise there's little point in watching uh, this particular movie, but, you know, walking away and coming back, it's like, oh, what's the plot line? Well, you kind of remind us, you know, every, uh, at, at good junctures, I'd say, uh, certainly with uh, seeing the detective at work or talking to, um, I'll remember her name one day, Allison, mm -hmm. and uh, so on. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, a, could have could have been like, like a yeah, mini series, you know, with uh, tiny episodes as well, since it's, uh, uh, I'd say it's uh, not a traditional movie and very much a, um, well, uh, I like film essays and I'd say that this has uh, definitely got uh, elements of that going on with it uh, really as a discussion of narrative within this uh, loose narrative framework of potential doom for at least New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah, is... I may, uh, to answer your uh, earlier question, I may bring uh, some of those earlier cases cases that were mentioned or aspects mm. of cases that were mentioned in renee's uh, 
notes to self or notes to people who like notes or whatever I called it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I may flesh those out in future movies because I need, uh, I need, you know, stories for the 53, 51 or whatever upcoming yeah. movies. So you may see some of those stories actually being acted out. And uh, yeah, I thought of it as just a slow cinema, sci-fi comedy, primarily, you know, the comedy coming from the dialogue and with a uh, sci-fi story in the background. Uh, a little bit more entertaining than a regular film essay, but, you know, there is a lot of you know because of the narrate the two different narration no the one narration from allison character and uh, the renee and the uh chitrapati character which is movies chitrapati means movies in singhala uh, language of sri lanka discussing filmmaking that that does that's that discussion does that discussion does have a film essay quality to it yeah, I suppose it might be worth clarifying. When I think film essay, the, the first and main thing that comes to mind is Orson Welles's F for Fake. That's what I'm talking about. So I, I mean, as as you might guess from that clarification, I... Um, well, it could, be, it could be a narrative movie that has, uh, you know, film essay quality. Yeah, yeah. That's because uh, that's I, I know, uh, well, as with so many, many terms these days, uh, some of them are broad beyond uh, immediately useful uh, indication of meaning but uh, so that uh, that's more what I meant and also like uh, yeah I'm reminded with uh, your um, the slow burn the science fiction sort of background as an excuse you know or, you know as, as a reason for you know some sort of exchange or observations or what have you I'm curious if you've seen in I think his first feature length film Peter Greenaway's The Falls I have not seen it. Is it good? Oh, it is very good. It's set up as uh, a string of, I don't know, 30 some odd very brief documentaries set after an unspecified horrible earth event that has led some of the population to develop um, bird-esque symptoms. Wow. Uh, it is about three hours long. Uh, the director has often been confused when people say they sat through the entire thing start to finish because he very much designed this work as a sort of just on and then you can wander around and, you know, catch bits of it, go do something, catch more of it later. And um, like the uh, like the ba uh, the public band performances that would happen in parks and the like in the, you know, late Victorian, early Edwardian era where, you know, you mill around this entertainment. Right without being anchored to it right like uh, love diaz recommends people watch his eight hour slow cinema movies that's a good recommendation the longest movie i sat through start to finish was i think seven hours and 20 minutes mm -hmm. and that was an all over the place philosophical uh, dramatic reenactment theater style conversational and uh, some puppetry as well uh, the 1977 film Hitler a film for Germany which was yeah, a sort of heard about that yeah um, it's yeah. I've watched uh, you know some seasons or like a season of a in, of a certain series maybe six seven episodes six hours plus maybe all in one sitting so it's possible Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a weird thing. Yeah, I guess uh, yeah, not, not to stray too far away from your film, but it's, yeah, my, my brains hook up with like, oh, yeah, six, seven episodes of an hour series. I will do that. But when I look at a movie that's four hours, I think, mm, I don't know. That's, but uh, that's, that's neither here nor there in regards to uh, the disco detective. Now, is this uh, next film, what's, uh, what's the production stage for that? So the plot is, uh, I think you might have read about this uh, on Twitter. Uh, the government recovered 53 spaceships from other galaxies from thousands of years ago, maybe millions of years ago in some cases. From throughout the world, they brought them to New York over the 20th century. Now they've gone missing. 
So uh, they are hiring Renee and Allison to locate these missing spaceships. And there's other people, not so good people, maybe looking for the spaceships also. So oh, yeah. I'm working on the script. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Sacred Society for Slow Romance. That was mainly just uh, the Renee character and Allison character having conversations over dinner. This one will be like that, except faster and funnier. I think I want this to be more like Seinfeld. And they'll be running around all over New York, you know, <laughs> uh, rushing around New York, trying to find, locate these ships. So it'll be an action-packed, oh, plot-driven comedy, <laughs> comedy. So yeah, cool. I just talked to uh, Aaliyah after the previous uh, recorded conversation. Yeah, I'm hoping the script will be done by the end of the month, and then we're going to meet up, rehearse, start shooting B-roll, and then try to get the actual scenes recorded. So uh, the goal is to try to finish it up by the end of July. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah, move, move fast Yeah. Uh, mentality there. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see what you do. Uh, will this be more of a, an on-screen antagonist? Because there obviously was the peril in uh, Cosmic Disco, but no bad guys, so to speak. Yeah. No, not in the 53 uh, spaceships. It'll mostly be conversations about each of the cases. Then the next one after that, NYC UFO sex cult. We'll definitely see the cult leader and the cult so they'll be uh, the more on-screen bad guy, or at least the you know non-Rene characters, uh, non-Rene team characters related to the case, more visible and interacting with Rene. Okay. In the uh, in the next one, uh, the fifty-three spaceships, we may see glimpses of the spaceships, uh, drawings, at, or in various hiding places. Maybe, maybe some old footage of the spaceships. So I think those will be uh, part of the transitional, you know, the, tra the transition sequences that I do in between conversations. Okay, oh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, so yeah, again, uh, I do have to get going here, but it was great to do this little recap and uh, definitely uh, I'm on board for when you have your 300,000 view party, which I'm guessing is sometime tomorrow afternoon at the uh, <laughs> at the uh, rate you're going here. So great. That's, that's fantastic. And of course, you'll see me on and around Twitter covering of all things soon a film festival. I know you have your feelings about those. But, I like uh, film festivals. Generally, oh. I like I also I don't mind Hollywood or film critics. I just have some complaints. Oh, yeah. well, as, as as we all do and should. So. And where can people find most most of your stuff? Oh, most of my stuff, like yeah. my my writing stuff. Why, that's at three six six weirdmovies.com. We uh, explore a lot of fringe cinema, a lot of indie cinema, and a lot of underground cinema. I myself, usually, if I'm volunteering for my weekly movie. I hunt down the lowest budget thing that Greg has uh, put on the menu. So, nice. yeah, I, I'm gonna I, start promoting those more, a lot. I uh, I'm about to launch 53 blogs for the 53 new movies, yeah. and each one will focus on different type of movies. I think, and I'll I'll look through all of your coverage and see where I which blog I can post uh, which things at. Wow. We appreciate that, and also I can say 366 is looking forward to uh, the the next in the Disco, Cosmic Disco Detective Renee saga. Awesome. Yeah, I'll send it over. Excellent. All right, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, yeah. See you around Twitter.